Summer's ways so new can begin Summer's eyes don't understand But I think it does Interoperability that makes it easy to leave so that you can leave a social platform but still send messages to the people that leave behind, or you can leave a, a mobile platform that still use the app and data and so on. In the same way that we need to get people out of the fire zone in California, we need to let the platforms burn. Right? Uh, preserving them is, um, is, is not going to make them better. There isn't a future in which Google is even bigger, and the fact that it's even bigger makes it better suited to being the unelected permanent overlord of how we use the internet. That's the real only thing. That's the thing, right? The image tag, yeah, with a bigger Google and a Google Blitz. That's like an incipient rage aneurysm. Yeah. Because the first half of the book is just explaining how all well these awful scams that rip off creative workers work, right? The underlying kind of accountancy fictions that are used to make them go. And then the second half of the book, which we really have to urge people to read, is shovel ready detail technical reasons. On the theory that because this is so unstable and then so unfair and so untenable, it will continue to erupt in crisis, in fire. And that when the fire comes, if we have in our minds better ideas for how to fix it, what my arch enemy uh, Milton Friedman called good ideas lying around, right? When, when Milton Friedman was like trying to create the Reagan revolution out of the New Deal, people would say like, Milton, how are you going to convince people to give up like social mobility and healthcare and a dignified retirement and, you know, subject themselves to like being four, four long tucking, uh, four long tucking uh, boot blacks uh, in your future? Say, look, there will become, there will come a crisis, and when the crisis comes, ideas lying around can move from the periphery to the center. And so we try to create these ideas lying around. And in in, in the internet con, I talk about what what policies we could do that would open up interoperability straight away. And um, there's uh, you know legislative. You said this both books. And in fact, you've said this to me before in other conversations. The the, the, the holy grail is interoperability. Yeah. Yeah, can, can you explain right. what that is? So it's one of those ideas that's both incredibly simple and incredibly complicated. So incredibly simple in the sense that like, you can put any water in your kettle, you can put any shoelaces in your shoes, you can wear any belt with your pants, you can put any gasoline in your car trunk, right? They're interoperable, right? And, and, and sometimes things are interoperable because they conform to standards, so you can screw any light bulb into any light socket. Sometimes they're interoperable because a new manufacturer comes along and figures out how to do something the original Someone's manufacturer didn't intend, so you can put a USB charger in your car cigarette And sometimes they're interoperable because a new manufacturer comes along and does something that the original manufacturer objected to and tried to stop. So you can read and write Microsoft Office files with the iWork suite, uh, pages, numbers, and keynote. I was at the Computer History Museum a couple of weeks ago and I saw the original Carter phone. This is an exact example of that, that that was exactly what opened up right. the telephone network. Yeah, yeah Carter phone and the Husha phone, which was this plastic cup that went over your phone and received it. Um, and, which, and, which, and Ma Bell objected to it because it was against the law to bring the phone network to attach anything to their network. Yeah. They said you were mechanically attaching unauthorized equipment to the Bell system and that that endangered national security. And it was a big, it was like a Bakelite cup that went over your phone so that you could talk like that. People can read your lips. Um, it was just so like they finally found a, 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 an abuse of corporate power so egregious that the judiciary wouldn't go along with it. That was the beginning of the end for them. And so, you know, computers are interoperable in a way that like nothing we've ever had before is interoperable. Because computers are universal, Turing complete von Neumann machines. They can run any program we can write. And that means that you can always write a program for your printer that will cause it to accept third party ink. 
you can always write a program for your car that will allow it to do third-party diagnostics for an independent mechanic, and you can always write software that will convert one file format to another. You can always write a scraper that will take data out of a social media service you left behind and put it in the inbox of social media service you went to. And what we've done is we've created this thicket of laws that we, we call them IP laws, but they're really not used as copyright or patent or, or any of the things that we call IP. They really add up to what Jay Freeman calls felony contempt of business. They're just a way, like, you can think of an app as just a web page that you salt enough IP onto that you can make it illegal to reverse engineer it. Right, in, in every other regard, it's just like a, just like a like JavaScript page, right? But but you you shake you shake the IP on it, and now it's illegal to compete with it, modify it, add to it, and so on. So everyone's trying to find the hook IP, the skin that they can have with it. So how do you pierce that skin? How do you get rid of that thicket? Legislative reform is a long haul. We should do it, but it's a long haul. Uh, there are some shortcuts to it. Rules that are requiring tech companies to start allowing interoperability. In Europe, there's the Digital Markets Act, which forces the largest platforms to expose their APIs so that third parties can connect to them. Um, and then we can restore the right to do the kind of reverse engineering that used to be allowed through things like, say, So right now, governments buying digital equipment, including things like cars that have computers in them, without ever securing from the manufacturer a promise that they can hire other people to maintain. And this is really imprudent bad public administration. And like Lincoln did not follow this principle. Lincoln only bought rifles for the Union Army that had uh, standard tooling and, and ammunition for this like incredibly obvious reason, right? Like you never wanted to have to go out to Gettysburg and say like, uh, "Why is kicking old boys? The manufacturer is not making any bullets this time, right?" And so you know, the the we could just say. As a matter of prudent public administration, no government in America buys anything unless the manufacturer promises not to legally attack people who are doing interoperability. And like, they will complain, but like if you're so emotionally fragile that you can't bear to sell stuff to the public uh, uh, purchaser on terms that accord with the public interest, like find another line of work, right? Like no one, no one forces you to sell to the US government. The US government's priority is not your shareholder's interest, it's the public interest. And so, you know, the, the book has got several of these kinds of shortcuts that we can take to kind of attack the problem at the margins as we um, make this frontal attack on uh, legislative reform. No matter who you are, you yourself can be tough and to be as